Welcome to the next part of calculus where we are going to look at the other side of the calculus coin. So we've looked first at derivatives which are incredible because they can tell us instantaneous rate of change but there's another aspect of calculus kind of the other side of the coin called integrals which enable us to calculate areas and do an intense amount of applications. So we're only going to be touching on these ideas in chapter four, but please believe me that they have tons of application and can do really neat things. So before we get to integrals, let's talk about another idea that is kind of similar. So we, what I might ask you to do is tell me what is an antiderivative. So imagine I have some function like f of x is equal to five. If I ask you what is an antiderivative of this equation right here, what I'm asking you is the derivative of what will equal 5? The derivative of what equation will equal 5? And so that's what I'm asking you. And when I, when I talk about an antiderivative, I'm going to call it capital F. So the derivative of what will equal 5? Go ahead and pause the video for a second and see if you can think of what it is. Did you get it? The answer is 5x. It's okay if you didn't get it, because when you look at this, it's obvious that the derivative of 5x is equal to 5. But there's one other element of this. Wouldn't you also have to acknowledge that the derivative of 5x plus 2 is equal to 5? In fact, it is. Or how about 5x minus 6? That's also equal to the derivative of 5x minus 6 is also equal to 5. So there's an infinite number of equations. However, all of them only are just have a constant either being added or subtracted from it. The core is the 5x whose derivative is 5. So what we say to acknowledge this is we say that the antiderivative is 5x plus c, where c is any real number. This is your antiderivative. We say that this is kind of a general form or a family of functions because that c can equal anything. Now let's think about that. Here's the equation y equals 5x, and you see that this equation has a slope of 5, up, uh, up over 1, up 5. Now this plus c would have the effect of just moving this line up and down, and you see that no matter how much I move it up or down, the slope of the lines are parallel, and so the slope is always the same, 5. So you can see both in numerically and geometry, the slope equation is going to be the same. It's going to be a flat line of 5 because all of these lines have a slope of 5 everywhere. So an antiderivative is saying what equation, if I take the derivative of it, will result in my equation that I have. All right, let's start talking about a completely different idea. One thing that we would like to be able to do in math is find areas. So for some area, some areas are easier to calculate than other areas. A rectangle or a triangle, it's pretty easy to calculate. But what if I have some kind of curved area? How can we find that area? Well, and this is touched on much more in, in full calculus, but let's just talk about the idea is what we can do is we can make an approximation. We can create a bunch of rectangles and this first group of rectangles are all going to be smaller. And we know that when we find the areas of all these rectangles and add them together, we know that it'll be pretty close to the area of the curved space. And I'm, I'm talking between the axis and the curved space. But it'll be a little bit less. We can do a similar experiment where we do the rectangles above the area, above the curve. And for that one, we know that the area is going to be a little bit more than the actual area underneath the curve because all of our rectangles or most of them were above it. What's cool is as you take the number of rectangles to infinity, this approximation becomes better and better and better. And in fact, there is a way when you take a limit, because like derivatives, integrals are based on a limit, when you take the limit as n goes to infinity, that approximation gets better and better and better. And the idea is that if it keeps getting better and better and better, and if you do it forever, you actually get the exact right answer. Now, here's the idea of the Riemann sum. We can kind of see that by trying to find this area right here. 
Let's imagine I'm trying to find the area. I should use a different number here. Let's make that 15. Let's imagine we're trying to find the area of this rectangle. Obviously, the answer is base times height, or just 15 times 5. But what if I told you there's another way? You would agree that this is the equation y equals 5x. Well, another way we can do this is by finding the antiderivative. We saw earlier that the antiderivative is y equals 5x plus c. We'll ignore the plus c this time. We'll just do y equals, I'm sorry, this is the equation y equals 5 because it's a flat line. And the antiderivative is y equals 5x. Okay, so I'll call this, I'll call this capital Y. So the antiderivative is 5x. The derivative of this equation is 5. Watch what, so watch what happens when I put in the 15. Notice that I get base times height. And so the idea is, if you take the antiderivative of an equation, so here's the line y equals 5x. If I go to 15 on the antiderivative, the value there is going to be the area of the rectangle. All right, so the value right here, where this value was of the antiderivative of this y equals 5 equation, is going to be the area of that rectangle. And what's really cool about this is that this doesn't just work for rectangles. It works for anything where we have an equation that we can find the antiderivative of. So importantly, antiderivatives are, are because antiderivatives and integrals are really similar, but there's an important difference. Antiderivatives are, I have f of x, and I want to know what function I can take the derivative of to get the little f of x. And usually we have a plus c right there. That's an antiderivative. A Riemann sum, which results in an integral, is when we've got some curve and we take a limit on the number of rectangles in that curve, and that produces an area. But what's cool is they both are, in a way, antiderivatives of the function you're looking at. It's just one of them is a limit, and the other one is just an answer to an equation. Which brings us to the fundamental theorem of calculus. And this, to me, is one of the greatest mathematical achievements we've ever come up with. And that is that derivatives are the reverse of integrals. So. When we're doing this, let's say we're just trying to find this area right here from A to B. When we're looking at the integral of that, we're saying the integral from A to B of your function with a differential. And this little dx means the infinitely thin rectangles that we're approximating. So this is the idea of the Riemann sum. And we just spent the last three chapters talking about how cool derivatives are and how we can take derivatives of a function and do a lot of interesting things with that. But what the fundamental theorem of calculus is saying is that integrals and derivatives are just the opposite sides of the same coin, which is just wonderful. It's just wonderful. There's a lot of ways you can write the fundamental theorem of calculus, but my favorite way is saying that f of x is equal to d dx of the integral from a to t f of t dt. And I'm not going to get too bogged down in explaining this right now because we need to just get to the examples in your homework. But what this is saying is that if you have a function and you take an integral of it, and then you take the derivative of that integral, you end up back at the same function again. And don't worry about the fact that t got replaced with x. That's just a way to show that it's independent of our input variable. The point is, is that these two operations undo each other. The derivative and the integral undo each other, and f goes to f. Visually, what this is saying is the following. Let's do the integral of something slightly different. Let's start with a line this time. And we know that the antiderivative of that is a parabola. So the derivative of this is this. The antiderivative is of this is this plus c. We know by now that this line represents the slope of this parabola. But it turns out that this line is telling us the area enclosed by this parabola and the x-axis. Here's what I mean. 
if I take this point right here, call it 10, I might be interested in knowing what is the area from here to here. The answer is whatever point is here on the derivative function. So this value right here is this area right here, whereas this equation is telling you the slope of this one. And hopefully it would kind of make sense that slope and area would be linked to each other. The steeper this slope is, the higher our derivative, which means we're generating more area. Notice that as I move to the right, this line gets bigger and bigger, so we're adding more area faster and faster. That's related to the fact that this line is going up. Again, it's hard to just explain this humongous idea in just a couple minutes, but hopefully you understand the core, which is the derivative tells you about slope, the antiderivative tells you about area, and the integral tells you about area. What we're going to do now is look at a couple of antiderivative examples, and we'll start getting into this. Thanks for watching.